Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. If this morning's scripture passage sounds familiar, it should. Jeremiah preached from this text two weeks ago, focusing on Paul's prayer for the Philippian church, and also on his own prayer for us here at CPC. But I wanted to return to this passage this morning to take a closer look at what Paul has to say about how God goes about bringing spiritual growth in our lives. In the verses that come just after our text this morning, Paul continues with a prayer that includes quite a few superlatives. And to be honest, it's a bit daunting. In verse 9, he speaks of a love that overflows with full insight so that they might be pure and blameless. It can be easy to gloss over these words, but this isn't just religious talk. Paul actually means what he says. And this is a, prol, a pretty tall order for anyone or any church. So how does any of this become reality? Only by the direct and ongoing work of God. Verse 6 sums it up. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work in, among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. The confidence that Paul expresses is not primarily a confidence in the church of Philippi. It is a confidence in God that rests in his knowledge of how God works. A confidence that God's work and purpose will be successful, no matter what. Paul's description here is quite brief, just a single sentence, which is quite remarkable for Paul. <laughs> but this verse is significant because of what it reveals about the process by which God transforms us. There are three key things here to notice. First, it's, it's God who begins the work, not us. Second, God takes the long view. The work begun in us is a long-term investment, and God will take the time to do it right. And third, God leaves no work unfinished. Whatever it takes, however long it takes, God will see it through. I want to take this verse as our starting point this morning because it describes a pattern that appears over and over throughout the Bible and throughout the history of the church. God begins something in a person's life, maybe as small as a mustard seed, and then as it grows, the unexpected happens. And what was previously the status quo of life tends to go out the window. This is often the point at which God's people tend to falter or to doubt or sometimes even get in the way by trying to help or accelerate the process. But God is in it for the long haul, still has work to do, and continues working faithfully. This pattern also turns up in the Gospels, the records of that period in time when God works directly through the life and ministry of Jesus. So I'd like to spend some time this morning looking at how Jesus goes about changing people. Of all Jesus' disciples, Peter offers a marvelous picture of God utterly transforming someone's life. Eventually, he'll become the leader of the apostles and the head of the church in Jerusalem. But how this happens is an amazing story of God's grace, power, and incredible persistence. So, as we turn to look at the life of Simon Peter, we find the first truth about how God works in us. God always begins by meeting us as we are, right where we are. Now, this might seem obvious, where else can God begin? But this is worth a closer look, because sometimes we can tend to think and act as if God expects to start somewhere other than where we actually are. And since this is impossible, we immediately feel stuck. Our internal dialogue sounds something like this. I have to be a better person than I am in order for God to do anything more with me. This is exactly what happens with Simon Peter. Let's take a look at our second text for this morning. This is coming from Luke 5, uh, verses 1 through 11. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, that's the Sea of Galilee, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. 
Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked all night long but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. <laughs> but when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. The word of the Lord. Now, one thing to notice about this passage is that this is not Simon Peter's first encounter with Jesus. In the previous chapter, Jesus visits his house and heals his mother-in-law from a fever. So he knows that Jesus has miraculous power. What is odd is in the days that follow, while other people from all over are coming to see Jesus and hear him preach, Simon Peter is back at work out on the lake. But this time, he encounters Jesus on his own turf. He's a fisherman by trade, and he knows his business. When Jesus tells him to let down his nets, we hear in his response the voice of the skeptic. <laughs> Jesus, I know what I'm doing. You're a teacher and a healer. I'm a professional fisherman. You deal with religious questions. I deal with the world of business and commerce. So you don't really understand. Nevertheless, out of respect, I'm going to put down the nets, even though there isn't any real hope. <laughs> and then something happens that truly amazes him the biggest catch of fish imaginable. And this time, Jesus gets his attention. The healing of his mother-in-law apparently wasn't sufficient to keep him from going on with life as it had been. <laughs> but this was different. Jesus had met him at the very center of who he was. And God's presence and power was made clear to him in terms that he could not ignore. So Jesus meets Peter exactly where he is the only point where God's good work can begin. His response to Jesus is telling. Immediately, he becomes uncomfortably aware of his own inadequacy. Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. How strange that at the very moment that Jesus meets him, just as he is and where he is, Peter is suddenly overcome by the conviction that he cannot even be near Jesus unless he were to be a different and better man than he actually is. For Peter, the situation is impossible. But God has work to do in Peter, and Jesus' response is equally telling. Jesus doesn't contradict him. He doesn't argue. No. If anything, Jesus' refusal to contradict him implies a kind of tacit agreement. It's as if Jesus is saying, that's right, you are sinful. But that's beside the point, and I'm not really interested in talking about that right now. Peter can't get over his own shortcomings. But to Jesus, these are totally irrelevant. Because for Jesus, this is the starting point and not the finish line. Instead, Jesus' response reveals the second truth about how God works in us. God takes the long view, working one step at a time and usually begins by upsetting life by it as we know it. And this is what Jesus does with Peter, who feels entirely out of his league and is ready to write himself out of the story. Go away from me, Lord. But what is Jesus' response? It's one of assurance. Do not be afraid. This message is God's standard prerequisite before trying to do anything with us. In the Bible, these are the first words that our human ears hear in nearly every encounter with the divine. Because whenever God shows up, you know that something big is about to happen. And things might get scary. So God reminds us, don't be afraid. In Peter's case, Jesus then moves on immediately to turning his world upside down. From now on, 
you will be catching people. And here is where the real miracle happens. Moments before, Peter had shrunk away in fear, overwhelmed and paralyzed by his own smallness in comparison with the power of God present in Jesus. But now, he recognizes God at work, and he responds. All of this, this sweeping change, happens in a matter of minutes, hardly more time than it takes to read about it. Once Peter realizes that he is already standing in the exact spot where Jesus intends to start with him, he becomes free, free to respond to Jesus' invitation. But despite the amazing events of that day, there's still a long road ahead for Peter. In the years that follow, in Jesus, God continues to work on him and the other disciples, teaching, leading, challenging, as they live and travel about together. And all the while, Jesus is talking to them about the coming kingdom of God. The full meaning of this isn't always clear, but they know that this is why they are together, and this is what they're moving toward. You know how the story goes. Jesus' popularity grows, expectations are high, and then something unexpected happens. He begins to talk about his own untimely death at the hands of the religious leaders. The disciples don't get it. And there are some tense moments, especially between Jesus and Peter. But they stick with him. And even when things are getting downright dangerous, Peter takes a stand saying in Luke 22, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. But that's not what actually happens. Just hours later, Peter abandons Jesus and then even denies knowing him three times over just to save his own skin. After all the many days and miles together since that first day beside the lake, after all the stretching and struggling to understand Jesus' words, after all the good work that God had begun in Peter, how did it come to this? Had Peter finally written himself out of the story? Even after the miracle of Jesus' resurrection, Peter still has a problem. When the true test came, he failed completely. He abandoned and denied his friend, his teacher, his Lord. And so for him, the incredible joy of discovering that Jesus was alive is mixed with the terrible prospect of having to face him again, this time exposed as an unfaithful coward. The Gospel of John records this encounter between Jesus and Simon Peter in some circumstances that are uncannily familiar. Peter and six other disciples spend all night fishing on the Sea of Galilee, but catch nothing. And in the morning, a figure on the shore calls to them and tells them to cast the net over the right side of the boat. When they do, they catch a huge number of fish. And at this point, they recognize Jesus. Peter, his joy overcoming his fear, leaps out of the boat and comes to shore ahead of the others. Jesus has a fire prepared, and when the others arrive, they all cook breakfast together with some of the fish that they had caught. Then, Jesus has a conversation with Peter. Three times, Jesus asks Peter the same question. Simon, son of John, do you love me? And three times Peter responds, yes. And after each affirmation, Jesus gives Peter a command, feed my sheep, tend my sheep. Peter had done the unthinkable. He had done nearly everything he could have to disqualify himself, to write himself out of the story. He had created a gulf between himself and Jesus that seemed to him to be impassable. But, in a quiet conversation, asking a simple but central question, Jesus closes that gulf. Peter denied Jesus three times, and now Jesus asks him three times to affirm his love. That's it. It was that simple. No condemnation, no lecture, no penance, no long negotiations about the terms of his reconciliation. Peter loved Jesus, and that was enough. And this is where we witness the third and perhaps most important truth about how God works in us. God does not give up or let up 
until we are complete. God simply never quits. And that is good news indeed. It might appear to us that there are obstacles that are too great for God to continue with us. But that is an illusion. An illusion that is produced in part by our limited perspective, but happens mainly because we don't realize, or perhaps we don't believe, that God's grace is absolutely relentless. In Peter's case, God still had work to do. And in this encounter, we see not merely a reconciliation. More than that, Jesus immediately puts Peter back on track by giving him a charge. Feed my sheep. And so, God's work with Peter continued. <clears throat> and what was begun long before kept on going, step by step, little by little. And like the patriarchs and prophets that had come before him, and just as the young church at Philippi would experience in the years that followed, Peter found himself in the hands of a God that was faithful, patient, and determined to see him through. A few years later, when Paul tells the Philippian church of his confidence in what God is doing and will continue to do in their lives, he is saying something that is central to the very character of God. In Paul's words, we see a nutshell form the way that God works in us. First, God begins in what is often the most unlikely of circumstances, right where we are. Next, God takes the long view, patiently engaging us in a process of growth and change over our entire lives. And lastly, through it all, we have the assurance that God will not leave us unfinished. God plays for keeps and intends to keep us. Sure. All of us still have work to be done, and the road may seem endless at times. But from God's perspective, that work is as good as completed. There is a certainty about this, an eternal quality that is difficult to fathom. But through the grace and mercy of Jesus, that is how God sees us. It's complete. Finished. That's what's so amazing about grace. God refuses to let go of us and always finishes what was begun in Peter, in the Philippian church, and in us. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for loving us with such tenacity and for never giving up, even when others do, or when we do so ourselves. Help us to remember and to receive your grace anew each day. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.